All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm Jesper Juhl. I'm an associate professor at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts School of Design, just uh, across town. Um, and so I, I changed the title of, of my talk, and uh, I should explain a bit. So, so in a way, actually, I, I had a version of this talk that, that was accepted five years ago, but I had to cancel. And, and in a way, what happened to, the, to the, the original talk was one which was very much about asking a specific philosophical question. And then five years passed, so the original talk is already in history, except it didn't happen, of course. But in a way, this talk, in a way, asks a bit more a kind of historical question about a specific argument. So you'll see. All right. So, so it's like this, right? So I think in games, we usually expect that we can put in effort that will influence the game state and the outcome of the game. And we tend to ex expect that we will feel emotionally attached to this outcome. So we'll be happy or unhappy if we win or lose, etc. Uh, but then there are a number of recent games, uh, often called walking simulators, which kind of don't do that. So they often tend to limit our options for interacting with the game world, and also I think tend to, they tend to limit, as a consequence, a feeling of being responsible for the outcome. So, for example, uh, Dear Esther is one example, I think Proteus would be another, Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, uh, Gone Home, uh, Firewatch. Um, and so here's Proteus. So walking simulator is a kind of divisive term. And so people who make walking simulators are kind of uh, divided over whether they have to reject it or kind of reclaim it as something positive. But certainly it kind of, to say a game is a walking simulator can be a kind of criticism, criticism, criticism saying that it's not a real game because it doesn't have a real gameplay because it only simulates walking. And I think, why would we even make such games? And I think the point is that walking simulators are really best understood as a response to a kind of foundational contradiction in games, right? On one hand, games in general, they tend to play that role of aesthetic experiences. They, they, they are quite unworklike. They serve no obvious utility. And I think we tend to assume that we play games for their own sake. And I also think that many developers are very clear, and theorists, I guess, are very clear about the ambitions of having video games recognized as an art form. But the weird thing, of course, is that actual game playing tends to involve something very different. It tends to involve like, very rationally optimizing our strategy in very work-like fashion. It tends to involve playing towards goal. Goals tends to evaluating game objects for their utility. And so this makes games, I think, in general, a, a kind of poor fit for a generic template for art or aesthetics, in part because of the kind of rationality and the optimization that we perform when we play is often thought of as being inauthentic or very different from games. And I think well, they're very different from aesthetics, very different from art. Right, so you would say that, that in a way, game, inside games, what, what is going on inside games seems to be opposed to the, kind of, the, the category or the status that games are, are generally assigned. And so I think what walking simulators really do is that they do something very radical. They reject the gameplay and the optimization that characterizes most games. But when they do so, they also, also present a quite conservative and traditional ideas, idea of aesthetics. And so I think this is part of, in a way, what makes it easier to imagine walking simulators exhibited in a, in a gallery setting, because in a way, by being radical in a, from a video game design perspective, they often become quite conservative from a kind of aesthetic perspective. And I should also say, I, I don't really care so much about this particular set of letters, like A, E, S, T, I, H, E, T, I, C, S, right? Uh, but of course, it, aesthetics has a very long history that's been addressed by many people. But I'm really interested in, I think, this specific, specific idea of the aesthetic experience as being disinterested. Uh, of course, this is part of the kind of Kantian tradition and so on. Uh, I think we can also think of this kind of more concretely or, or sociologically as a way of behaving towards art and culture. So Baudieu talks about how high culture exhibits a calculated coldness, and he talks about the ice, icy solemnity of the great museums. So certainly there's a, I think say sociologically there's this idea that, that, high, that kind of art and, and high culture is kind of very subtle and quiet, whereas kind of popular culture is like immediate and festive and loud and noisy and so on. Uh, 
so in the tradition of Kant, uh, Scherchinet talks about the aesthetic relation as one where we perceive without regard for practical utility. So when we engage aesthetically with something, we, we don't think of what it can be used for, right? So, so that, and, and uh, so this is the idea of the, the perception without practical identification. We don't think of what, what an artwork can be used for, we don't think of what, what utility it has. Um, and Chinette also distinguishes between aesthetic relations that are solicited, like uh, something that's designed to give that experience, versus uh, that kind of experience that can be triggered by something. So typically kind of nature, right, obviously. And I should say that there are other views of aesthetics, but I do think this is kind of a culturally dominant one. Um, and I want to talk about this both uh, in, in a kind of, from a kind of philosophical point of view, but also how I think this is implicitly and sometimes even explicitly used by game developers as well. Uh, but let's talk about this in detail. So on the first level, like the aesthetics of video games. So if we play a game like Spelunky, we understand that this game, uh, this piece of software is not meant for kind of writing uh, term papers or uh, filing taxes. It's, it's a piece of software that's designed for, for play. And so we use it for the kind of experience that it gives us rather than for its practical utility. Right? So, uh, in Sherry Schnett's term, she, he would say that it's a game that solicits an aesthetic response from us. And so this is a kind of general frame of aesthetics. Um, we can also think of this when, when kind of aesthetic, the aesthetic relation is triggered. So, so as a parent, I can testify to the fact that children will play with food. And so what the tired, the tired parent ex ex experiences is that the child disregards the utility of the food and sees the, the, the food as something entirely different, something that's kind of aesthetic, that can have kind of texture and color and create kind of sounds and, and can create kind of reactions from adults and so on. So, so this is a the situation where the child has an aesthetic response to, to, to food that goes beyond the utility of, of, of making the child healthy and so on by eating it. But one of the points then is that if a child is very hungry, it, it does not actually play with its food. So many, I think, discussions of playing games tend to focus on this issue of safety. So Chris Crawford talks, of course, that you're safe from like what's happening inside the game, like the experience of conflict and danger. There's a discussion of the magic circle, where which is sometimes closed, sometimes open. Uh, but I think um, it's interesting to talk about Martin Burkhardt talks about the, in the genesis of animal play about an, how animal play only happens in a relaxed field where the animal is not stressed or frightened. So it's only when we are not immediately threatened we can spare the attention to something that has no immediate utility, such as a game. And I think well, then we can see like, what, what is it that makes games weird? Well, you can see on level two, well, we actually, when we navigate a game world such as like here, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, um, here we have a situation, we have, we have to get to a, a, a cold area, we don't have cold resistance, so we will die very, very quickly. Uh, there's a group of uh, bokoblins close to that area. They're guarding uh, uh, both some spicy peppers and a cauldron. And if you kill the bokoblins, you can cook the spicy peppers, and which will give you cold resistance, etc. Uh, and so, to play a game like Zelda, I think the majority of games is to always like think of game objects in terms of their utility, right? So. You, 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 you figure out how to optimize your strategy, you, you consider which aspects or which objects in the game world have utility for, for the task at hand. And of course this makes video games very different from this kind of general idea of aesthetic objects. So when we play video games or games in general, much of our energy is spent rationally optimizing our strategies. And if we think of this idea of like the, the prerequisite for play as feeling safe and for the aesthetic relation not being forced to attend to practical utility, we can see that in a game, like we're mostly not safe and we don't actually have the time to relax and we do actually have to look at, at objects for the practical utility. And you say this is like, I think, the standard kind of model for games that you give it as a world, you give it some tools. There's a set of challenges. Over time, you can improve your skills. You can learn to use the tools in new ways. And tools are challenged by the environment in different ways. So this is very kind of standard way of developing a game or structuring a game. 
Well, so, but what is the problem? Well, so for example, uh, this is the path by Tale of Tales. So Tale of, Talk, Tale of Tales, I interviewed and talked about this idea that, in a way, to them, the virtual world as such is, is the interesting part. And, but the, the, the moment you ask people to try to kind of conquer a challenge, they, they talk about that they ascend to that systematic level, like they forget the world, they only, they only think about the rules of the game, or only think about optimizing. And so to them, this is kind of counter to, to the kind of idea of the, the art or the aesthetics they actually want to make with their games. I think this is also expressed a bit more kind of, or, or very kind of explicitly philosophically by, by uh, developer Brian Moriarty, where he kind of uh, defended Roger Ebert's claim about games not being art, etc. So let's not go into that. But Brian Moriarty's argument is that he, said, he, he looks up a very kind of traditional idea of art and talks about like supply art is like a toy, it has no purpose. But then the problem is that, that goal chasing, in a way, is a distraction that kind of prevents us from kind of experiencing video games as art. So he says, what, once you enter Heisinger's magic circle and start groping at preferences, the attitude of calm, radical acceptance necessary to cultivate, in, cultivate insights is lost. Um, and so you see, this is also very kind of, again, quite traditional ideas of aesthetics and art. And I, I, don't really do, I don't bring this out to say just because it's important that games are art. Uh, but I think it's just a good example of how if you apply these very traditional ideas of, kind of aesthetics and art, it, it's easy to come to, to this conclusion that games just shouldn't really have goals or that optimization is actually a bad thing in general. Uh, it also goes beyond video games. Um, so there's this uh, Yasunari Kawabata's uh, 1951 novel, The Master of Go, talks about the situation where the old master is, is, chal is challenged to a game of Go by, by the younger player. And it's, it may be said that the master was played in his, plagued in his last match by modern rationalism, to which faulty rules were everything and from which all the elegance of Go as art had disappeared. And so the problem is then that, that the younger player doesn't really respect Go as a ritual. Uh, and uh, with all its traditions, but only actually tries to win. And so, in a way, you can say that the argument then is that because the play, younger player simply tries to optimize the kind of values of beauty and ritual are, are kind of destroyed by that optimization. Um, I think similar arguments are, were made by, by the new games movement, uh, which of course often had, in a way, competitive games of sorts, but usually there was no single winner. And so this is Bernie de Corbin's argument that if you only have one, if winning is the central goal, everything else becomes lost, right? That there's a loss of, say, community, or other values if you're only focusing on a goal. And I think you can even pull this out a bit more beyond, uh, beyond aesthetics. I think there is this common idea, and this is from Charles Taylor's book on, book on authenticity, that, that, that instrumental reason or like rationality in a way disenchants the world, that we become inauthentic by by thinking only in rational terms. Right. Uh, and so this brings us back to this kind of what I call like the aesthetics of the aesthetics of the aesthetics of video games. And so this is, I think, what I, what I think is what walking simulators do. So this is where I think designers very consciously try to remove like the utility seeking, the optimization. So, and I think this is really best understood as a reaction to this, what I just, just discussed, this kind of discomfort with, with goals, with optimization, with kind of rational strategy. Um, and so a game like DRS that doesn't really give us any tools for interacting with the game world beyond walking. It doesn't really develop those tools. We don't really learn any new skills. And so, but what do we get in return for giving up these kind of conventional sources of enjoyment in a game? I think we can kind of sum it up like this, right? Like, stop and smell the roses. Um, so I think it's important to understand that what I call this kind of the third layer, the aesthetics of the aesthetics of the aesthetics of video games, it's actually not about going back to play to just that first open kind of experience of a world. It's actually about the reverse. It's actually about removing almost all, about keeping almost all of game structure. In a way, also keeping goals, at least the, the possibility of completing a game, but you just remove the element of games where players can improve their skills, where they can improvise, where they can play. Um, another interview with Taylor Tales, he specifically talk about 
the, that, that the, the, the elements of rules and goals actually, in a way, they prevent us from having certain kinds of experiences. And I think this is kind of really central uh, that, that it's not just that I am saying that this third layer, the aesthetics of the aesthetics of the aesthetics of video games, is a, an aesthetic layer, etc. But I'm also saying that these notions of what constitutes aesthetics and art are actually applied quite often by developers. And I think this is one of the kind of reasons why walking simulators exist. Um, and you would say, like, well, is it actually a third level? So we need, probably need to distinguish between two kinds of, of strange games in this case. So on the left, we have uh, games which are kind of open-ended, which don't necessarily have goals, they don't enforce goals. Games like the GTA series, or, or The Sims in this case. So in this case, games like on the left actually gives, give players a lot of mechanics, a lot of, a lot of things or tools for interacting with the game world. Uh, but the other, what the games on the right are called, like the, the aesthetics of the aesthetics of the aesthetics of video games, tend to actually have goals, they tend to be completed, it's clear that's something you need to do, but they just don't give you a lot of tools for interacting with that world. And so, this is also the reason why on the, on the games on the left, we tend to think of games that allow player expressions, expression, but, but the games on the right, the games that we're talking about here, are really games where you think of them as being about developer expression, because they don't really allow the player to do a lot of things. Right? So, I think these are games that give us the time to stop and smell the roses, or listen to the narrative voiceover, or read the left behind diaries, or watch the pixelated sunset. Um, and so I've talked here what I think is a, about what I think is a fundamental question about video games, like how can games which have traditionally been derided for their frivolity or the lack of, of utility, how can they at the same time be prime examples of utility and goal-oriented activities? And I talk about this in, in kind of three levels or three kinds of aesthetics, right? So on the first level, video games are often thought of as prime examples of activities that we think of having no practical value, um, and which also in a way is, is solicit an aesthetic relation from us. But on the other hand, video games are also situations which are designed for goal-directed behavior within that space. And so they have to seem to concern an aesthetic relation to something that can seem antithetical to aesthetic relations in the first place, right? So it seems that we have a seeming like non-aesthetic, a, a utility-oriented object to the, to the objects, in, oh, sorry, let me do it again. It seems we have a non-aesthetic and utility-oriented relation to the objects in the game, but then we see this kind of optimization as being kind of aesthetic in, in, in the first place. And I think this is Ties to just, I think, a general criticism of video games, that they're too competitive, they're too goal-oriented, they're too, too loud. Um, and then I think it's interesting, on the third level, to think about like, how these recent games, the walking simulators I'm talking about, are not simply about going back to play, but actually like, keeping video game structure, but just giving players less to do, and trying to, kind of re, to like, apply a new level of, kind of aestheticization to video games. Um, so I think the strategy optimization we find in most games actually does run quite directly counter to conventional aesthetics. And as we respond to this, I talk to a, a, about a lot of games that kind of break with this tradition, but also use a new kind of video game design in a way that's quite conservative. So it's very radical from a video game perspective, but quite kind of conservative from a, a kind of aesthetic point of view. It brings video games much closer to traditional ideas of aesthetics and art. And these seem to be, I think, games that you can more easily imagine sh being shown in a, in, a, in a kind of art gallery because they have this kind of quietness about them. And I think I have a kind of double, re double reaction to this. I think it's both kind of really refreshing to see new kinds of games that challenge your ideas of what games can be. Uh, on the other hand, I'm actually kind of skeptical about the arguments made for these games. So I think in general, I do find that video games and games are often interesting because they confound the ideas for what video games can be or what, for what aesthetic objects can be. And in a way that the kind of tension between the first and the second kind of aesthetics, the fact that video game, we see video games as aesthetic objects, but that when we play video games, we behave in an entirely different way. I think that tension, in a way, seems to be the most, one of the most fascinating aspects of video games. 
And so I think, to some extent, I think that you say the concrete games, in a way, are more interesting than the arguments that are made for them. So that I do think that 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 these games are really interesting because they kind of confound ideas for what a game can be, and that they get the meaning from the way they deviate from the norm. But I think we can, I think perhaps if I wanted to generalize and say that perhaps more realistically, video games are interesting specifically because they don't fit traditional aesthetics because they are interesting, because they push us to reconsider what we mean by aesthetics, and because developers continue to find new ways of making games that fit and don't fit our preconceptions, because they make us do or not do entirely new things. Thank you. And I should say, this is from, from a, this is from a, I have an upcoming book about independent games, a probably called Handmade Pixels. This is the mock-up O'Reilly cover. So it's supposed to come in, in next year. Thank you. Um, Rebecca? Hi. Um, I wonder when, since it's a kind of relatively recent building of horror games, uh, I'm thinking of Amnesia, mm. uh, Soda, and um, Powerless, which are like they're puzzle games, really, mm. where we traditionally classify them, but you can replace every puzzle with just pressing a switch yeah. and get fundamentally the same mm. experience, I think. Where do they fit in your technology? Uh, I mean, so also Amnesia is, of, of course, made by, by the Chinese room, so, so, so I think it, it, you would say it's certainly part of. I think they're slightly different from, say, Proteus, which very clearly tries to be this kind of meditative, poetic uh, thing. But I mean, they, I, I do think they're part of the same trend, so, like in a way looking at video games and realizing that, that video games both have, have kind of aspects of walking or just exploring a, exploring a landscape or listening to a narrative, and, as well as things which are kind of traditionally considered kind of core, like the challenge and so on, and realizing you can just tone down the challenge. It's not, actually may not be that important depending on what specific experience you're, you're, you're trying to get out of it. So I definitely see that as, as part of the same trend. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Chris? Uh, gosh. Um, thank you, that was a really interesting talk. I wanted to ask just to clarify um, how you set up the issue in the first place. Mm. Um, in setting it up, it sounds like you're assuming a conflict between aesthetics and utility. And I'm really, I'm, if that's what you meant, I'm really skeptical of that. It uh, seems to me that there's um, often cases where the aesthetic value of something comes from its utility. Um, so, for instance, there are works of art that are intended for certain occasions. Mm -hmm. like, think of funeral songs, mm -hmm. or even drinking songs. Mm -hmm. like, when you're not drunk, the drinking songs don't have their aesthetic impact. Right? Yeah. Um, in those kind of cases, it seems like they're understanding the aesthetics of those things really has to be understood within the occasion that they're meant. So, mm -hmm. if you think of that as their utility, then it sounds like utility is coming from their aesthetics. So, maybe this would be resolved if you can just expand on what you take utility to be. Uh, so, so in a way, I think that, this, this, that it would be a great counter-argument to, to the talk I, I wanted to give, I didn't give five years ago. Uh, because I, I think, to, to me, that then the point is not necessarily that I, I believe that this is what aesthetics are fundamentally like. I'm just saying that I think this is, this is perhaps a kind of, that, that is a culturally dominant idea of aesthetics, right? And I think that you can see this happening in these games, and these games exist as response to that particular idea. Uh, I, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't defend that idea in general, that aesthetics have, have no utility. I'm just saying that I think this is just really a kind of culturally important uh, notion that you can see at play here. Yeah. In that way, I agree. Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, so I wanted to ask about, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, you were talking mostly about goals, that is the win state, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, but what about uh, the uh, fail state of these games? Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that what is distinctive about them uh, is that they often do not have any fail state. Whereas you were speaking about goals, and most of these games do have goals. So in Protobus, I mean, the, the single mechanic that they have, mm -hmm. walking, is actually basically looking for triggers. 
Yeah. You look for the triggers in the world. I remember when I played Proteus, I didn't know what to do with this game. I was super frustrated. And then I ran. And then what I did is, contrary to what you're saying, I, I, I regarded a uh, uh, walkthrough, mm. and someone told me, oh, you have to do this and this and this, and you can finish the game. Yeah. So I was just like, ah, I have to mm. find these triggers. Yeah. So I mean, but what differentiates Proteus or Gogo is that I could just walk in. Nothing happened, so I, yeah. I wonder why I didn't say anything about fake yeah. states. I mean, so, so goals was in a way not meant to be the, the code word, like the central idea word was meant to be like kind of optimization. Yeah. And so, so you'd say that, that that like a game like Proteus, because you're not, you don't have fail states, you're not forced to optimize. To, to me, that would be the the distinction. I, I do think Protoss is, is kind of funny because in a way it's marketed, it's kind of promoted as a game that has no, as if it has no win state, but it, but it is kind of weird. It turns out you can kind of just trigger all the seasons really quickly and, and be done with it, which yes. is kind of like weird. Like what? So, so it, it, I think it just has a slightly different, it's promoted slightly different, that, differently than it, what it actually is. But you don't, I mean, you don't have to trigger the seasons, right? It's only if you're like a very impatient person. <laughs> Not, not judging, of course. But. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, it made me think about this moment in What Remains of Edith Finch, where you um, you play as a baby, like an eight-month-old baby called Gregory, in the bathtub. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, sorry, spoilers for anyone who hasn't played it, but the point is you trigger things, or you, you have to mm -hmm. turn the water and knock down the, the whale. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of some goal to, to hit, I suppose, mm. um, but obviously no challenge there. Um, but the point is that as a result of your success um, in hitting those goals, this eight-month-old baby drowns. Um, and I think perhaps what we're missing is a kind of critical language here. What we're missing is an aesthetics of competition or an excess, aesthetics of success or aesthetics of failure, because mm. in that moment, my success created an aesthetic effect on me and it was such a bittersweet moment in the sense that I was pleased that I had found the right trigger and that gave me some satisfaction at the same moment. Okay. Um, and the other thing about that for me is that the aesthetics couldn't be separated from, from the goal. I know what remains to be is a bit more than a walking simulator but it's still in that same genre I would say. And yeah, I think the point was, is in that game, you, the whole point is you're trying to work out is there a family curse or not? And actually what becomes meaningful is me as a player almost having this godlike, fate-like role in the death of this baby has meaning too. And so I feel like all of the, I don't know, I just don't know whether we can separate out the aesthetics of goal-driven competition, aesthetics of success and failure from the aesthetic meaning overall. So yeah, I'm wondering whether we just, what, what we're really lacking here is just a critical meta language. To, to dig down into, the, into the, this type of aesthetics, this new breed of aesthetics. Yeah, sure. I mean, I kind of usually distinguish between yeah the the, the rule driven kind of the, the rule the rule level and, and the fictional level and and say like when you do when you do something that's where you cause something bad to happen against your will or perhaps like deliberately, then it's kind of interesting because there's a conflict between like your feeling of success and your feeling of loss in the fictional world. So i will perhaps talk about it like that, but I agree, it's, it's, a, it's a super interesting, complicated, and so sometimes these things come as a package and sometimes they, they don't. Uh, but actually, could I ask you know, just add another point? Um, that I, actually, I think one of the things about video game history is also that a lot of these arguments are made about what constitutes a good game or a bad game or a real game. Um, and I think what, I'm, what I think is really interesting about something like walking simulators is when people try to make these philosophical arguments about how to make a new kind of game. And I think walking simulators or these kind of games are really, really interesting to play. What I always worry about is that then people, people just set up a new standard, like these are the only true, authentic, kind of good games, and every game where you try to optimize is fundamentally evil and flawed. That, that's what I always worry about. So, so I, I like the way these kind of arguments can work to create new kinds of experiences, but I always worry about them being put up with these kind of absolute rules. So like if you're a teacher, you, your students are not allowed to make a game where you can become better at them or something like that. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much. We have to move on. So, Thank um, you.